Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, the first thing you're going to notice is why does this microphone not work? Uh, and that's because it's not designed to work. This microphone is transmitting online. Uh, it's not for your benefit. But we're, um, So, uh, after that little bit of logistics, uh, welcome to the Berlin Center seminar series. Um, and uh, our host uh, for this seminar will be Research Area 5. And I will shortly hand over to uh, Malin Schlander, co-leader of Research Area 5, to present uh, today's speaker. Um, when we're having questions, we will pass this microphone around, and that's so that your question is also heard online. Um, and it will work. It won't work with you either. It will just go straight online. So don't worry. It is actually on. Okay. So uh, Malik, can I hand over to you? Hello. Good morning. Thanks for coming. Uh, I was prepared to give a long biography of Antonio. Uh, and when I actually asked him this morning, he's been at uh, the same department and the same university his whole career. So that cuts down like 10 minutes of introduction. Antonio is at the University of Santiago de la Compostela. And uh, Antonio, I have to say this carefully, I said before that he was my oldest collaborator. Um, but what I mean to say <laughs> is that he's actually um, when I started out as a PhD student, he was uh, my very first collaborator. Uh, and I remember I was hysterically afraid of meeting this very important professor. Uh, and then when I stepped off the plane, I met Antonio. And uh, we've been working together ever since. Uh, so we work a lot together on wetlands. But Antonio is the master of statistics uh, and paleo records. Um, so Antonio, thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Malin. Um, I'm happy to be here because I love Stockholm and uh, we've been visiting Stockholm for not only because of, of Malin, because I also like the city and Sweden in general. Um, I've been also up to Umeå and Nabisco and it's a really nice environment for work and collaboration. This is probably the main reason, friendship, right? So <clears throat> the talk um, for today uh, Malin said to me, "Would you be able to give a talk, or would you be willing to give a to give a talk at the Berlin Center for climate change?" I say, "Oh, climate again? Oh, um, um, okay. I'll I'll see if I can do something which is interesting." So, I started with this title, "Climate's Hidden in Peat," because we have to look for it. It is not self-evident, but it's well known. And this is a phrase you will find in almost every peat paper, saying. Peatlands are reliable archives of whatever it is, atmospheric metal deposition, climate change, or whatever. So I, I hope that by the end of the talk, I'll be putting some of these ideas in mind, that they may be good archives, but they are not so straight as mo most people think. You have to dig into the pit, actually, to look for those signals. So. Thinking on what to do, uh, at the end I decided, well, I just put three examples on how we proceed with a pit core and how we extract this information. Because it's not, as I said, it's not self-evident. It is not telling you, you get the numbers, it tells you it's climate, it's climate. Sometimes it does, but it's not really, um, most frequently, it's not the case. You have to get the information out of it because there's a lot of signals on the, on the pit. So the first one is, uh, the first example would be about pit color, which is a simple thing, but it's an unusual parameter analyzing pit. It is seldom analyzed. We, we usually do pit extract with uh, um, sodium hydroxide and look at the color of those extracts, but why don't we look at the color of the pit itself without any extraction? So I will put an example on color. Then the second one, I reduce it from a recent presentation in a conference on the Biogeomoon and its combination of tools to get information out of the data that we collect. And the third example is on long-term mercury accumulation. My idea was we can trace climate on peat and get climatic signals, but once we get the signals, can we use them to get information how was the cycling of 
some elements, for example, atmospheric derived elements, can we see if climate is controlling the accumulation in peat? So it's just the other side of the coin, right? These three examples at the same time, they go from different time scales, from centuries, millennia to tens of millennia. And so we are opening the scope on different opportunities for climate to perform. And they also are a little bit more complex from the top, which is very simple, into the others. So there will be bits of statistics on it. But this is something that I really like. So the first example, color, has been recognized as one of the indicators of changes in pitlands. Here is the pitlands are from northwestern Spain. And the previous picture is also northwestern Spain. Spain is not as dry as the, as the Sahara, let's say, right? So northwestern Spain is a rainy area. It rains up to 2,000 millimeters per year in some of the places. And this is one of the reasons, probably one of the reasons, why there are bogs there. And when you cut through a bog, and this is a natural cut, you can actually see changes in color from very dark, dark, well-decomposed pit material into more plant uh, vegetables uh, or plant material very easy to identify, and the color changes. But color is something that we are used to, and we are usually defined the color in terms of subject, uh, really subjective. But we can measure color. It's not quite difficult. This little equipment here is a spectrophotometer for color, solid color. So you put a sample here and press the button, and you get numbers. This is what I really like. And the numbers refer to a given color space. In this case, I've been using this space which is called LAD space. L stands for luminosity, brightness, and it goes from zero black to 100 light uh, white, and it has two chromatic components, A and B. And A goes from green to red, positive values, red, negative values of A, green, and B goes from blue to yellow, positive values of B are yellow, and negative values are blue. So we can take our samples, and just to make sure that I have a homogeneous material, I just mill the samples and try it. And this is what you get. This is the core, and you can hardly see any difference in color. It's like, well, it like brownish. And if you go into the tail, you can see, well, maybe there's a section here which is a little bit more dark. But when you measure, we actually get this. This is the projection of the chromatic components. And you see, there are a slightly red and a mixture of a slightly red and a slightly yellow. It means brown. Yes, brownish. This is my appreciation. Not that bad, but this seems not to have too much information. And we go into the tail in this little area here, what we see is that two box, they have a kind of trend. So there's a variation, a little variation, a 5% variation on the red and a 10% variation in the yellow component of both. And when you look at, actually, at the milled pit samples, there's shadows of brown <laughs> in there. And if we take a look to the luminosity, it's a 10% variation. So there's, it seems there's not much changes in color. But a big change doesn't mean, or a small change doesn't mean there's no information. When we actually plot the changes with depth, in this case, age, I just transform because there's two different box and they have different age models. So to compare them, I plot this. The first thing you, you get, this is the luminosity, is this long-term trend, which is well known, which is accounting for peak decomposition. Very quick decomposition in the upper layers, the, more, the ones containing more oxygen, and then very small changes with depth in the anoxic zone. When we detrend for this long term, it means we eliminate it. What is left is this what you see here. The detrend luminosity and the chromatic A and B parameters. And you see the changes. There's synchronous changes in color. There's some sections 
they're lighter in color and more chromatic and there are sections which are darker and less chromatic and this is stored as a color as a very easy to measure parameter in peat and when you look at this kind of seesaw pattern climate comes to your mind quite easily it's like a sign climate 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 should be there so we go and say what what kind of climate records we can compare because this is a few hundred years and I just plot here the total solar irradiance which accounts for the amount of energy the Sun was sending to us to the earth um, since 800 to present what well, less we don't have the whole record but uh, if you take a look this is what for climate it's well known this lows in activity of solar activity the well-known grand minima which are the Oort, the Wolf, the Sporer, the Mounder, the Dalton and so on and when we look at the records the trended color what we see is that there is lighter and more chromatic peat accumulated in this grand minima most of them including this one that is not recorded in the TSI but it's recorded in some papers as uh, around um, six, uh, 685, which coincides roughly with this peak here. So it means that during these periods, periods of low, lumen, uh, low um, uh, solar irradiance, there were more accumulation of lighter and more chromatic peat. And if we remind that the upper layers are those with lighter, more chromatic, it means less decomposed peat. So coinciding with the minima, there is an increased accumulation of less decomposed peat. And with maxima in solar activity, they coincide with lower values of the color with more decomposed peat. Seems very easy and seems to be a climatic signal in the terms that it's controlling peat decomposition and this is well known so we usually like when things fit right and this is the first example with the scales of hundreds of years the second example is a bit more complex and uh, in this one we try to use a combination of nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy infrared spectroscopy and one statistical technique to get signals out of the information why we use the combination this one NMR takes a long time it takes between eight eight ten hours to analyze a sample and we usually work with hundreds so there's some time limitations this one is quite quick non-destructive you get a measurement in a minute or two depends on how uh, the resolution you want for your spectra and this is a way to work with a lot of data because here we can get information on the composition of main components main compounds of the peat a few of them five four uh, but here you get thousands of values for every spectra so there's a need to pull off this information into something that simplifies the signals or at least um, give us the opportunity to get the most important information. Um, for those who are not familiar with PLS, which is the partial lit square um, technique, um, it's close to a principal components analysis. Close and the main difference is that in principal components analysis you have vari uh, uh, variables and those ones are fed and the covariance is extracted into components so there's no limitation there's nothing forcing the, um, the covariation to to be pulled out of this uh, of the uh, total variance but in PLS you have one or more response variables so in this case the variation, destruction of the components is forced to explain the maximum of the response variable. And I leave it there, if there's questions. So as predictors, we are using uh, the uh, mid-infrared spectra 
And as response variables, we use the CN ratio, the delta 15N, and this samples, uh, a few, some of the samples, 40 out of 100, were analyzed by NMR to get the carbohydrates, proteins, lignin, and lipids abundance, a relative composition. And I'll, I'll go in more detail with one of the examples yet, not to extend very much, right? So this, uh, this is a summary of the results. The samples in the graphs which are in gray correspond to the training set, the samples used to perform the statistics. The samples which are in red correspond to the expected values. And the model that is used in spectroscopy, the signal, uh, the mid infrared, to produce a fitting of the, the values. For these two properties, we have the whole record, all the samples. So these are the only two that can be tested for validation. That means that we have another set of samples. We just calculate the estimated values and then we correlate estimated versus observed values and we get a validation. If you see um, the number of components in PLS, they are called Latin variables. Extracted varies depending on the property. It means that there's more complexity or less complexity in every parameter. The CN ratio needs four. It means that there, you need at least four signals to reproduce the changes with depth and age of the CN ratio. But we need 10 to reproduce the lignin content, this very seesaw pattern, very, very difficult to reproduce. And uh, the uh, fitting values are very high. It's 95% of the variation is contained on the model, on the statistical model. And the validation for this two is 0.92. That is quite good. If we were to look only for obtaining expected values, this is nice. And uh, then we can just reproduce the whole expected trends with depth and go into detail and analyze them. But we can do something more, and this is the example of the scene ratio, and, and this is where the story turns into the climate. It's not so evident because the ratio is, as you see in this figure, there's a, a rapid increase in the values up to roughly 50 centimeters and then more slowly changes, changing with depth, with age. And again, this is because the aerated zone of the pit of the pitland is where the composition is faster and the anoxic zone is where the composition is slower. So as geochemistry playing the game with the microorganisms are decomposing the peat. And that's the main trend. And in fact, the first component extracted from the spectroscopy signal reproduces this change with depth, right? So we have one signal and now we can isolate other signals. There's Three more, and I will only uh, explain this one in detail because that's the one that can be climate. So um, just to explain a little bit, the first, the first one, this variation with depth, this rapid increase in the CN ratio and then slowly increasing with depth, corresponds to this spectra. This is a statistical spectra. It's no longer the original spectra. But what we have here are loadings. It means the weight of the absorption bands on this variation. And this very picky bands here corresponds to aliphatics. And these bands here correspond to aromatic components. And this one that has negative scores, it means this one increase with depth and age, and this one decreases. This corresponds to the polysaccharides. And so this component is describing the consumption of polysaccharides and the accumulation of less attractive organic matter for the microorganisms. So the trend is a trend of increasing aliphatic moieties and aromatic, mainly lignin, and a decrease on polysaccharides, cellulose and hemicellulose, basically, right? And that's this... Uh, uh, the trend with depth and age. And it's well known because there's 
many other parameters of the peat that do the same as carbon, for example, right? But if we look to the third component, it's uh, again we see the seesaw pattern and corresponds to this diagram here. And this diagram is a little bit similar and looks opposite to this one. Here we have the um, absorption bands of the aliphatics, but it is not as well distinguished as these two, so they indicate less decomposed aliphatic moieties. This one correspond to um, carboxylic groups and some of the aromatics, some of the lignins. So this one indicates, because of the negative values, that those sections with negative scores have increased accumulation of this plant of this material that looks like less decomposed plant material. This is the kind of signal, if I reverse it, that I get in the upper pit samples. So again, the negative uh, the sections with negative scores will correspond to this. And it is fresh material, but I could say that it probably also points to to changes in vegetation. Because if it were whole plant fresh material, I would expect this pick here, the polysaccharides, to be more intense, less decomposed. So this probably points to fresh material, but a different kind of vegetation. And now if, uh, if I presume this can be climate, I have to compare with another climate record. And this is also a well-known record. This, this uh, corresponds to the hematite stained grains from the northern um, hemisphere and this peaks have been defined as the bond events, right? The bond cycles. The this well known climate cyclicity in the northern hemisphere. And if we take a look to this graph down here, this is the P the the P that we have analyzed, this PDC record. And uh, I plot first just to start the residuals. It means once we get rid of the long-term decomposition, what else is left? This variation here. And this variation looks very much like this. And that variation is mainly accounted for by the third LB, the third Latin variable, the third component of the structured information. So this one may, in fact, be indicating us climate, a climate signal varied on the CN ratio. It's varied because it's behind other signals there. At least another two. And I just plotted here just to make that it's easy to see that they fit, right? That as the, um, um, during the bond events, climate was colder up here in the north and it was warmer between bond events. And what we have is a fitting of this component this of uh, the CM ratio. It means that something was happening down in, in Spain when it was cold or warm here. And because if, if you remind that uh, the lower sections corresponded to less decomposed material, then we have to link. It is not probably temperature. It is probably indicating humidity. The hypothesis now is that during cold phases up in the north it was drier down in the south and during warm phases in the north it was wetter down in the south. The wetter the bog, the less oxygen available for decomposition, the higher the accumulation, the bioproductivity and the accumulation of fresh plant material and this is the connection and it fits well or not. We can just take a little look to this episode here, bond event, event zero, bond cycle zero, it's the little ice age again. So we are revisiting the color and it says here there was a decoupling. It was cold in the north but it was not dry in the south, it was wet in fact. So this represents a change compared to the last 5,000 years of the peatland responding to climate. And it's given more local information on, while maybe the Little Ice Age was not a homogeneous response all over the Northern Hemisphere. 
And from this, we jump to the third example. And now we go to 15,000 years of changes in central eastern Brazil. We collected years ago a call from there. And uh, we were interested, of course, in getting climate signals and also getting some information on atmospheric deposition and performing of humans on the area, etc. In this case, I'm just concentrating the talk on the long-term mercury accumulation because it turned out to be a rather nice story for us. And it will be a, a little bit more complicated because more recently I decided to jump into another kind of statistics. So going from principal components analysis into um, PLS, which is the partial list of squares, and now I'm just jumping into a structural equation modeling. And I will tell you the reason just in a minute why I felt the need to jump and give a step further. So in a previous work, we already analyzed this is the mercury content of the bit in this record that increases from the bottom to the top 30 centimeters, and then it goes down. Um, also in a previous work, we took a look to the uh, um, elemental composition and through principal components analysis we were we able to identify four major processes affecting the composition of the peat. The first component was composed of um, elements related to atmospheric dust deposition, very fine dust particles that have been accumulated. Something that I maybe have to say is that this mire is located on top of the mountain in a small catchment, but on top of the mountain, and the whole area is quartzite. There's nothing else than quartz, and quartz, quartzites that do not produce large amounts of other elements, except for silicon and maybe some chromium, which is interesting. The second component was related to the accumulation of silicon that comes from the catchment itself and it affected the bulk density and of course the carbon content and we identified it as fluxes of mineral matter from the catchment into the pitland a local signal and this one is a more regional signal the third component was uh, catching the CM ratio and the nitrogen content and we label it as a peat OM decomposition, the composition of the organic matter of the peat. And the third component contain only the delta 13 carbon um, um, ratio. And this ratio varies between very high, it's always negative, but very high values into very low values and it's represented arid climates from wetter climates and back to arid climates in the last 3,000 years or so. So the next step, we question ourselves, can we explain the accumulation of this toxic heavy metal? Those are the catchy words, the sexy words for the papers. Um, through these components, that means how much of the accumulation can be controlled by atmospheric deposition, by climate, by peat decomposition, or by mineral fluxes? And the answer was yes. And we did it with this technique, which is uh, regression by principal components. It means that you first extract the principal components, and then you do a multi-regression, which is an easy uh, tool, right? And why to use the principal components instead of the original variables? It's because the principal components are decorrelated. So statistically, they are more consistent to get a proper fitting model. They do not interact between them, right? Um, there was one sample stepping out, very high value. This sample was a 74 centimeter. And we'll visit the sample and the next slide or two. But the fitting was rather nice and it was 82% of the total variation in mercury that, can, that we can model with this only four components. And the end model was something like this, right? And if you look at the model, the strong climate signal because 
Scotch mineral erosion was controlled by rainfall in the area. The higher the rainfall, the higher the erosion. So the greater the fluxes of mineral matter into the pitland. And because it's only quartzite, it's only quartz coming in, and quartz contain no mercury, every time there's erosion and there's the flux of this material, there's a decrease in mercury concentration. So it's a dilution effect. But the other effects are mainly controlled. This is controlled by climate, and then the other two are controlled by wet deposition, increased mercury accumulation during water phases, so more um, uh, washing out of mercury from the atmosphere into the pitland, and also increased deposition during um, events of dust events, um, moments when there was more dust coming into the pitland. But the organic matter diagenesis, there has been a controversial issue for um, accumulation of elements in peat. How much of the accumulation is controlled by the availability of functional groups to bind the metals? This is a hot topic in our area. has a very, very low um, weight on the total model. So the model is mainly controlled by climate. And uh, you would say, well, that's fine, so why to go further, any further? It's okay. The main thing is that I find this model have a, the model has a limitation. We know that environmental proxy, processes interact. They are not totally independent. So the model is assuming that dust events are not controlled by climate, are not controlled by the catchment. The catchment is not controlled by, it's not controlled by climate, and so on. And so it's a nice model. It has been published, but I'm a little bit concerned if we can do something um, to get more detail. And <clears throat> to end first with this, uh, with the model, we can ask a little bit more. This, this image that we have here is a general idea of the model, but it doesn't mean that any of these processes weighted the same along 15,000 years. There must be parts of this record where the, the, the weight of the processes have changed. And this is what we try to also model in this graph. And we define it, oh, I hardly seen, um, five phases where, and, the, and the, the first one is mainly the fluxes from the catchment when the pitland is starting to grow and there's still a lot of potential energy, there's more material coming from the slopes into the pitland than when the pitland is almost filled with peat, right? And this is a change in that is inbuilt on the evolution, the geomorphological evolution of the pitland itself. A second phase where atmospheric dust control most of the mercury accumulation. A third phase where decreased um, fluxes from the catchment enable a higher accumulation of organic matter and a higher um, binding of mercury. A third phase in which wetter climates promote a greater washing out from the atmosphere. And the last one in which there's decreased mercury accumulation because there is decrease in wetness, there's a decrease in atmospheric uh, dust and there's also uh, a decrease in the CN ratio. It means uh, the degree of the composition of the peat. The peat cannot handle most of the mercury that is coming. It's not able to bind it. So I, w I, I was for a while I was happy with with that model, and then I thought, well, we, we should do something because um, I would like to consider interactions between the processes. If there's any, and if I can, or we can evaluate them. And this is why we sample, uh, we jump into the SEM, the Structural Equation Modeling. And this is a simple projection of a SEM model. Um, it is called a structural model. And here you have those, well, those in, in the edge, the outer ones, are our indicators, our proxies. That means that for the atmospheric dust, I define this as the proxies. For the fluxes of mineral matter, I define this as the proxies. For organic matter decomposition, those, and for climate and time, those two, right? 
And this is the response uh, variable. They are called latent because there's proxies pointing to them. So as in the previous model, we can evaluate the weight of any of those one, two, three, four, four, five processes into the accumulation of mercury. But one of the beauties of this um, um, modeling is that you can also establish links, interactions between the factors. And to start, I assume, well, climate can have, have an effect on catchment, middle matter, because it's erosion. It may be controlled by climate. Climate can also control atmospheric dust, because this is central eastern Brazil, and the dust has to come from somewhere, so it's the wind bringing the dust, and that's climate control. And it also affects organic matter decomposition, as we saw. If it is wetter, or if it is drier, there will be less or more decomposition. And I can also evaluate if there's trends with time in atmospheric dust, in fluxes of middle matter from the, from the catchment, in climate, and in organic matter decomposition. That's the model. And this is why to jump into these models, to measure those effects, to measure those interactions between processes. And these are the results. It's like voting. Um, the values here at the edge of the, the model, the outer model, are the values for the proxies. The, the indicators. These values, the closer to 1 or minus 1, they are loadings. The closer to 1 or minus 1, the better the indicator for the latent variable we have defined. So here you have these elements have been selected for atmospheric dust, and they have 0 0.92, 0 0.93, 94, 0 0.97. They are very good indicators. Almost all the variation they show in the pit core correspond to this latent variable. And if you see the same for organic matter decomposition, the same, well, climate and age have to be this one because there's only one indicator per, uh, and the same for uh, the catchment mineral fluxes. So the model says good indicators. I did my work because I did previously the PCA. I, I, really, I, uh, I already knew that these are good indicators for the process. I was not interested on this. I was interested on the interactions. <laughs> That's the model. And the numbers that you have uh, between the lines, right, corresponds to what is called the total effects. And they are standardized values. So the closer to 1 or minus 1, the greater the weight a given process has on the response variable and the weight, uh, the, the, the heavier the interaction. So to simplify, it's 76% of the mercury concentration can be explained by this model, which is mainly controlled by fluxes from the Kutchman, which are negative, very high values. It means that every time there's mineral matter coming from the Kutchman, the, it, the mercury concentration decreases. And the organic matter decomposition that was not very heavy in the previous model. It was a very small amount of the effect. And here is 0.74. But we have, to, if we go further back, this one has a negative score. It means that every time the CN ratio increases, peak decomposition increases, there's more mercury accumulation. And those are the, the main actors. But now we can see that this value here, 80% of the variation of organic matter decomposition is dependent on time and climate. So the actual indirect effects are controlled by climate and time. And then you see the total effect. But then we understand a little bit more of what's going on. And the other ones have uh, more moderate effects on the model. And now I'm more happy. Say, so, well, I'm happy enough. And this is the projection of predicted versus observed. It's nice. 76% is not that bad. And you see there's a few samples just stepping out of the model. This one is the same sample as in the previous model. If we get rid of this sample, 
then we increase this to 80%. So that single sample produces a lot of variation because it's an outlier, it's an extreme value. And because I'm not comfortable with that, I usually try to look farther in detail and to look farther is where is the other 24% of variation? How does it look? And because we have a prediction for the model, we can just calculate residuals and take a look in time, and this is how it looks. This is the variation which is not explained, but that model which is controlled by organic matter decomposition and fluxes from the catchment, which are again controlled by climate on the back. And when we look at this, we see that there's, there's peaks and some low values here. And the peaks correspond to ages between 0 0.2 and 0.8 Ka, 8.2, 11.5, 17.5, Ah, These are well known for us. If you plot them with the end grip record, the higher values than expected correspond to colder climate phases and the lower correspond to warmer phases. So it's climate again in the back <laughs> controlling how much mercury was deposited not only through the fluxes and the control on the organic matter quality to bind the mercury but also a direct control on Heavier, um, higher accumulation or lower accumulation, depending on it was cold or it was um, warm. I'm a little bit tempted to say that this may correspond to something we published in Nature back in time, before we met Malin. It was 99 that colder climates in peat produce less re-emission of, of the deposit mercury to the atmosphere while under warmer conditions there were more re-emission and this may correspond to those peaks. Of course there's other hypotheses I will not tell the audience now but I will be happy to discuss after that. So to end three main conclusions because I was not uh, I was not prepared to to give any uh, conclusion but yesterday I was reading some recommendations from the Bolling Center say you have to have conclusions to get some ideas to the audience of what's the value of your work. So the conclusions are first, yes I, I still believe um, peatlands are, are archives of climate change but the signals are hidden and you have to look for them and use the proper tools to get them. They are hidden not only because they are deeper in the peat and they are not self-evident but they are hidden because there's other signals overshadowing the climate, right? And to, as a final remark, that I would like to opt for multi-proxy and multi-methodological approaches if we are going to get more information and more details on how our environment works. Talk so me, Kat. Thank you, that was very interesting. So uh, I, I had a question about the, the interaction between the peat decomposition and the, and the binding of mercury in the peat. So if, there, if, the, if the peat was not well enough decomposed, there were not enough binding sites for the mercury to stay in the peat. Did I interpret that correctly? Yes. So what would happen to the mercury then? Would it flush out laterally or would it become a, a gas again? Or um, it, the, uh, it'll happen both the two the two yeah. options um, on on one side there will be lateral flow so the mercury will, will just run out with the uh, run up waters and the second is that if, if it stays in a way because it can be physically attached for example to a sphagnum it will be re-emitted during warmer phases 
but that will depend. It's a balance between the growing of the peat because it will depend on the depth to which if you have a present surface and there's some mercury deposition, if the peat grows quite rapid, then it is buried. And peatlands are very therm thermally controlled. It means that the temperature with depth does not change very much. So once it, it is buried, it will, be not, it will not be affected by temperature on the surface if it is very, let's say, 10, centimeters, 10 centimeters down, down in the peat. But if it, uh, the warming happens, let's say, the same year on summer, there will be re-emission. There will be revolatilization of mercury to the atmosphere. Yes. And yeah, I can follow up with the second question. I was, uh, I was wondering if you wanted to comment. On, uh, you, so you use delta 13C as a climate crop securely, but mm, I, we tend to use that as an organic matter decomposition proxy when we look at doubt. Sort of doubt yes, uh, yeah. I, I, I know. I know the complexities of the uh, carbon ratios. Why we use this one? Um, I didn't bring the sample. The, the well, I have it in my computer if you if you want to see. But um, most of the change is not controlled in this case by peat decomposition because the values go from fifty thousand to roughly thirty thousand years ago. They uh, they vary around thirty minus thirteen minus fourteen, and they drip. They drop suddenly to minus twenty five <laughs> minus twenty four. And you cannot explain that as a change in the complete decomposition. It's uh, it's mainly uh, a climate signal going from because these high values are do, do correspond to um, plants that grow on arid environments, and we have the organic matter composition of the peat, and they also point to this kind of plant material during the um, uh, the arid phases and more C3 plants during the switch from C3 to C3. yes it's it, it's a, uh, yeah it switches from C3 into C4 and then back again in recent times to um, C4 plants yeah and there's also pollen analysis done in the same pitlands and the C4 plants are in the section the C4 the C3 are in the water phase so we are confident that most of the signal corresponds to major climate changes in this case but I would not say it's always the same. This is why I like models. Thank you. Any other questions from the panel? I'll go on the other side. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you for a nice presentation. Um, have other have you have other methods been utilized for this peat record in Brazil? Um, when you say methods, you, yeah, you mean ana analytical methods? Yeah. Um, as I was commenting, we, we try to combine as, as many proxies as possible. We usually try to cover those two main areas, the biotic and the ab uh, um, abiotic, right? And in the abiotic, we usually analyze for the same peat samples, um, the uh, inorganic composition of the peat, uh, elemental composition, isotopes, when we are lucky, um, lead isotopes, for example, um, and um, the organic composition, uh, molecular composition through pyrolysis, DCMS, and more recently using mid infrared because it's quicker and it's easier to work with the data compared to pyrolysis that takes much more time to cut, make the numbers. And um, for the biotic, we usually do pollen analysis to get an idea of changes in vegetation. And we try to combine all these information. Something we didn't do as, for example, diatoms or other biotic proxies or uh, plant remains, for example. We didn't find the proper group to collaborate with, I would say, because this really depends on collaboration. We cannot handle everything, right? And it, it makes no sense. If there's people who specialize on plant macrofossils, it makes no sense for me to try to specialize myself on plant macros. And yeah, I'm interested in this Meyer. Has it been also a lake, or has it always been like which a, one? This this Brazilian peat. Oh no no no, it, it is not. Has it it's always been, or is it a high peat or just yeah a yeah? It, it's it's high peat. It's um, 
the, uh, the, the, the basal sediment, it's, it's quartz. It's um, quartz grains. It's, it's all sand. And the, the peat is start to grow suddenly. And so it goes uh, quickly from this sediment phase into a peatland. And there's no a lake component on it, right? As the, uh, the, the way the, the, the morphology of the catchment does not allow for that because it's, um, it's almost linear. So it has a drain on, on one side and it goes like it, it goes into a, a little stream that goes into a river. So there was no a dumb, dumb effect just to make it into a, a lake or a, or a pond at, at any time. This is what we will describe as a minogenic Maya. Thank you so much for coming, Antonio. So there will be sandwiches and Santiago cake. For the people who stay, uh, Antonio has brought the traditional Santiago cake. So it's your reward for sitting through the talk. <laughs> I think if we give Antonio one last round of applause.